great to sing about. God does great things. Where I run, I 
Anybody else wake up this morning uh, able to sing bass? Just cruds? Anybody else? Do what? You can't wake Oh, uh, somewhere in the afternoon? That's strange. Awesome. Great. Hey, guys, we are going to be in the book of Esther, and we're going to be in chapter 4 tonight. That's where we're going to read, and then we're going to kind of break down the whole story of Esther but we'll read chapter four together tonight. So if you want to go ahead, uh, Gentry's helping.
grab some Bibles. So if you need the one, we got I think we got three left there. If you want to grab a hard copy of the Bible, uh, if you got your phone, that's fine. Just make sure it doesn't become a distraction for you tonight. Uh, ho- hopefully you won't jump on any apps. Uh, check out who's on Clash of Clans right now, anything like that. Did, did some people just get convicted right now? What's happening? So y'all be coming down. I didn't, haven't even started the sermon yet. You're all like laying down at the altar. Uh, yeah, so we're going to be, this is the last week of the real story. Uh, like I said, next week is going to be senior takeover. And one of our seniors will give the message next week. And then we'll do pass the mantle in a couple of weeks. Uh, who's been here for a pass the mantle night? So about half of you guys. For those of you that haven't been here for a Pass the Mantle night, you won't want to miss that because we're going to be talking about how the seniors are handing off the reins of the student ministry to those of you who are younger than seniors, whether you're in high school or junior high, and our seniors want to pray over you in this next season of ministry without them. So it's going to be a very awesome night. Uh, You know those cool graduation cord things? You get one because it's like the mantle. So you get to pray over... You'll be prayed over by our seniors, so you won't want to miss the next two Wednesdays. Um, We'll be doing that. Okay. The story of Esther. How many of y'all have heard of Esther before? Okay. So you're kind of familiar with the story, at least to some degree. Uh, It's a very interesting story when it comes to stories in the Bible for a lot of different reasons, and we'll we'll get into some of those those big reasons. Uh, But first off, Know this, that the story of Esther ends the history of the Old Testament. So after Esther is finished, we get a little bit of little peaks with, the, with some of the prophets. But as far as having historical record of what's happening at a specific time, the history of the Old Testament ends with the book of Esther. That's kind of a cool thing. Uh, it's going to take this, the story takes place around 479 BC. That's before Christ. And a place called Susa, which is the capital city of Persia. So, video game people, Prince of Persia, maybe old school. Um, and the Persians have replaced the Babylonians, if you remember Nebuchadnezzar in that story. The, ba- they've, the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, have been replaced by the Persians, and now they are the mega power of the region. They're the, in the known war world, they're the greatest nation in the world. And that's until the Greeks come around, and the Greeks will actually defeat the Persians. And then who defeats the Greeks? The Romans. So now, and then Rome is in control whenever Christ comes. So now you kind of know where we're at in the world history landscape of things. And it's in this, it's in this story, this framework, that we find God's people, the Israelites, who we've been following the whole Old Testament, they're now living in exile all throughout the Persian Empire. So the Persians have come in, wiped out their towns, burnt everything to the ground, and then they've just sent Israelites to live in different cities. That way they can't be with their families. That way their culture gets dissolved into the Persian Empire. That's what's taking place. And if you've ever read the story of Esther or if you've seen the movie about it, what do we what do we kind of know? What happens? Esther gets married to the king. And here's what I hate about this whole story. If you watch a Christian movie about this, they turn it into this weird love story. You know what I'm talking about? It becomes like this weird tension thing, and they kind of fall in love, and it's kind of like, I don't know what to do, and you're the king, and I'm Esther. And, uh, and they play like that little back and forth game until finally they're like, okay, now we love each other. It becomes like this weird Nicholas Sparks novel and not a book of the Bible because we don't know what to do with it because it's so awkward and weird. We have a, an Israelite woman named Esther. She's marrying a... Persian king and all the customs and all the the cultures that are mixing don't mix at all. And so we don't know what to do with it. So then we just kind of make it up and make a little love story out of it. That's all we know what to do with it. But 
The real story of Esther is not a love story. It's actually a story about how God uses broken people to display his providence and his goodness. So if you want to write down one thing tonight, if you have a little notebook or a little piece of paper or you've got a marker you want to write on your forehead or your friend's forehead, don't write on your friend's forehead. But if you want to write one thing tonight, if you want to remember one thing, the book of Esther, the story of Esther is not about is not a love story. It's a story about how God uses broken people to display his providence and his goodness. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. But I'll let you I'll let you write down. I see some people still writing. I don't want to get ahead of you. So tonight as as we break down everything, we're going to look at the broken people in this story. We're going to look at what providence means and how we see that throughout the story. And we're going to look at God's goodness and how he makes good things come out of a bad situation. All right. Let's read Esther chapter four. Let's read. I just want to read chapter four for you. Kind of sets the tone. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathok, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathok went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city, in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathok went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathok and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner courts without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out his golden scepter, so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come in to the king these thirty days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king. Though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. So what I just read to you, chapter 4, is kind of the the main bump in the story. It's when everything kind of comes together, when decisions are being made because of this decree that is going out from the king. But first, let's, let's meet some of our characters in this story. So the story of Esther contains a lot of broken people. We think that 
we have some enemies and we have some heroes, but really the lines start to get kind of blurred when we look at everything together. So the first character that we get in this story is King Ahasuerus. A-H-A-S-U-E-R-U-S. Or known by his Greek name, Xerxes. The guys were like, what? Xerxes, X-E-R-X-E-S. King Xerxes was known for his anger. He was a hardened warrior that was that went to the bat went to battle against the Greeks. So he wasn't much of a ruler at home. He was more of a of a of warrior. So whenever he would come home, he would be known for his anger and his abuse in the kingdom. There's a couple of stories that you might find interesting about Ahasuerus or Xerxes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in one of the battles that he led, he had to cross a, a, a piece of ocean. And in order to get through, he could have taken a boat, but he decided it would have been faster. It would be faster for his army to go on foot than it would be to go on boat. So he had, he ordered 300 men, 300 engineers to make a floating bridge. Yeah. Okay. Kind of cool. This floating bridge would have been the length of 13 football fields to go from one one end across the, the part of the sea to cross over into battle. As it was being built, a storm came through and washed it away. Okay, bummer, right? Back to the drawing board? Not for King Xerxes. You want to know what he had done in his anger? He ordered the sea to be punished. He had the sea whipped 30 times, stabbed with hot irons, and they threw handcuffs into the sea as a way of showing that it needed to be obedient and submissive to King Xerxes. Then he beheaded the 300 men that had worked on the bridge to begin with. After that had been done, he got 300 other men to come in and begin rebuilding the bridge. This is not a nice guy. This is not tall, dark, and handsome Xerxes that we get in all the Esther love stories. Another story that you might find interesting is that Xerxes led the Persian army in a battle called at Thermopylae. Not Monopoly. Thermopylae against the Spartan king, you may have heard of him before, called Leonidas. Have you, have you ever watched the movie 300? If you have, you shouldn't have because you're a child. All right. But that battle is made famous today by that movie 300. Uh, was, it, was it Gerard Butler? Gerard Butler's in that one. Anyways, he's King Leonidas. Anyways, Xerxes leads the Persian army against him in that battle. It's where they have the 300 Greeks versus all the Persian army, and they head them off at the pass and all the cliches. The Persians end up winning and destroying them, but they have a great loss. So this is kind of, we believe that in historical framework that the story of Esther is taking place shortly after that battle. They've won that battle, suffered great losses, and now Xerxes is back in his capital of Susa trying to figure out what his next move is going to be. Do you think he's happy? Do you think he feels like he the war is finished or that he has some unfinished business to take care of? You can see all the anger and frustration that's going to boil out in this story. So as, we're, as, we're, as we walk into the story of Esther, what's happening is, is that Xerxes is at the capital and he's hosting a big party that's been taking place for six months. We don't know a lot about the party, but we can assume, understanding the historical relevance, the whole reason for this party is that all the other cities of Persia, all the other leaders 
are gathering and coming to him in Susa, and they're talking about what are we going to do with this war? How can we get more men to sign up to go to war with us? How can, how can we bring in other nations? How can we build these alliances? That's what's taking place. And in the midst of one of these parties, he asked his queen at the time, Queen Vashti, his wife and queen. She's also the granddaughter of King Nebuchadnezzar, which is kind of a fun historical thing there. So you kind of get the connection to come and show off her beauty in front of all the other men. You can use your imagination of what that was. She refuses and basically he goes, well, you're not queen anymore and kicks her out because no one refuses the queen or the king. You can see the anger of this guy, that he's impulsive, that he's just out for himself. He is a broken person. Also, nowhere in this story is there ever a time when he goes, wow, I believe in God now. That never happens in the book of Esther. Never happens. Our second character that we come across is a guy named Haman. He shows up in chapter 3. He's been promoted by the king to be the number two guy, like a prime minister. Uh, He's described as an Agagite, which is an unfortunate name. Does anybody remember a King Agag? Which is unfortunate. (laughs) King Agag and the Ag... (laughs) I can't even say it. Agagites were one of the groups that King Saul was told to go and completely and utterly destroy. Saul, King Saul, who comes before David, King Saul doesn't destroy them. He actually captures King Agag and brings him. And then, and then Samuel has to put him to death because Saul wasn't faithful to what God had called him to do. So, Knowing that, knowing that the Agagites were supposed to be completely destroyed, Haman wasn't even supposed to be in this story. But the whole reason why he's here was because of the Israelites' unfaithfulness. So he's going to come on the scene, uh, maybe fueled by the past, maybe it's just kind of the anger of the day towards the Jews. He hates this man named Mordecai, who is a Jewish leader in all, that's also one of the important people in the kingdom. And what he does is he presents this Holocaust-style plan to Xerxes where, hey, King Xerxes, I know that we've had a rough battle. Let me tell you, there's these groups of people. They're called the Jews or the Israelites, and they don't like you, and they don't really belong here, and they're not one of us. Uh, They're not in this war with us. They have this other God that they worship. They don't worship the same gods that we do. Here's what we could do. What if we just killed them all and we took all their money and all their land and everything that they had, all their resources, and we use that money to rebuild the kingdom, to strengthen our army so that we could go back to battle? Sounds great, doesn't it? So that's who Haman is. He comes up with this plan to take out the Israelites. I mentioned one of the guys that he hates is Mordecai. Mordecai is a Jewish official in the king's court. Uh, It says that he sits at the gate, so he probably judged civil cases. People would come up and go, he stole my goat. No, that's my goat or something. I don't know. And they had like, you know, whatever. Uh, So he would help solve these civil cases, but then he also offered his expertise to the king as well. Uh, he becomes Haman's enemy because he refuses to bow to Haman. Because Haman's elevated, everybody's supposed to go, oh, Haman. But Mordecai's like, no, I'm not doing that. You're not God. Mordecai, as he's sitting at the front at the gate, hears about an assassination attempt that's going to happen on the king, tells the king, saves the king's life. Does the king reward him? No, the king forgets because he's too busy, worried about his anger, and he's probably drunk constantly for six months in a row. Um, 
He hides his own and he tells Esther, our final character we're going to talk about here in a second, tells her and himself they hide their Jewish heritage. They hide the fact that they're Israelites. That never comes up. We know this because Esther is not a Hebrew name. It's a Persian name. We know this because Mordecai is not a Jewish name. Mordecai actually comes from Marduk, which is a a god, a false god. So they've both hidden their real identities in God. That leaves us with Esther. Like I said, her Hebrew name was Hadassah, which means myrtle or a myrtle tree. Uh, This tree makes a star-shaped flower, which is where we get Esther from because Esther means star or morning star which she's the star of the story. Okay. And she takes part in this weird Persia's Got Talent or Persia's Next Top Model, however you want to look at it. And she basically wins the attention and the affection of the king based on her beauty. In order to do that, she spent a year, before she even got to meet the king, she spent a year getting spa treatments. And as... As she's going through this process, it is, it is likely that she was used by the king as a sex slave. She took part in the parties. She married this Gentile king. But these are all things that were forbidden by the law of Moses. What I'm trying to say here is that even our hero, Mordecai, at the end, even our heroine, Esther, the namesake of the story... They're not super glamorous people. They're not perfect people. They're not living righteously. Now, Esther, we we just read in chapter 4, she shows us great courage. She says, if I die, I die. But I'm going to stand up for my people. Hey, there's some courage. But also, how do we get here? (laughs) How do we get here? A lot of not following the law of Moses. So, all that to say is that God is going to work in the midst of these broken people. Why is that, why is that helpful for us? Because I don't know about you, but in my assumption is that we are a group of broken people. We are a group of people that have fallen short of God's glory. We're a group of people that fall short daily. There's, there's, we don't live up to the standard that God has for us. So what does this show us? That God can use and will use broken people to bring about his will. So if you're here tonight and you're like, I don't think I could ever be used by God to do anything important. If God could use these people to bring about his will, he can use you. Especially knowing that you can be, your, your heart can be changed through Jesus. That makes it all the more possible to bring about his will. Number two, <clears throat> like I said, we're, we're going to talk about how the broken people, but we're also going to talk about God and what he's doing. Number two, God is never mentioned in the story despite making all of the things happen. Y'all are looking at me like I'm crazy. The name Yahweh, or Lord, never shows up in the book of Esther. How weird is that? That's weird, isn't it? It's in the Bible. The Bible is God's word. And yet, not not only does God not speak, but his name doesn't even show up in the 10, was it 10, 11 chapters? I forgot now. 10, 10 chapters of Esther. Doesn't even show up. There is, in the book of Esther, there's no reference to prayer. There's no reference to faith. And there's no reference to the law of Moses. That's strange. The writers of the New Testament, led by God through His Spirit as they were writing, never mention the story of Esther. Have you heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? 
It's all these fragments found of that, that date way back. Some of the earliest manuscripts to some of the, the writings of the Bible that we have. There wasn't one single manuscript found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that had anything to do with the book of Esther. And just for fun, the reformer Martin Luther wished that Esther didn't exist because of the fact that God seemed so absent from it. He didn't know what to do with it. So, all that to be said, just because God isn't mentioned, just because it's not mentioned, faith and, and, and prayer and the law of Moses aren't mentioned, just because the New Testament doesn't back it up, doesn't mean that God is not present in the book of Esther. Think about it this way. How many of y'all have been involved in theater before? Okay. I know you guys got some plays coming up, right? You have a play coming up? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so here's the deal. The actors in a play are great, but what happens when you don't have a tech team? Okay, so the lights may not work so people can't see what's happening. The sound may not work so people can't hear what's happening. The sets won't be set up how they're supposed to be set up. So when things start happening, it's not happening in the right place or it's happening out of place. Right? The tech crew are the ones that make everything happen behind the scenes. And Esther is one of those books where we see God working behind the scenes of the whole entire story. Even though we don't see his name mentioned, even though we don't, we don't hear prayer, we don't hear faith, we don't hear any of these types of things we expect, we don't, what we do see is we do see God working in the background, working behind the scenes to make everything happen exactly how it's supposed to happen so that his people will be saved. God is always behind the scenes working and making things happen. This is called God's providence. God is providentially at work throughout this entire story. So what is providence? If you want a definition, you can write this down. Providence is God using the mundane circumstances of life to bring about his will. So it's God working behind the scenes and things from like, I put my socks on today. Well, you put your socks on so you can put your shoes on because you're going to have to run, because you're going to do this. It's God working in the everyday little things of your life to make sure that things are supposed to go according to his will. That's providence. God is constantly at work. The other side of the coin is the miraculous. You've heard of miracles before? This is when God steps out of the mundane, expected things of the world and he does something supernatural to intervene. So the difference, providence, it's things that we expect to happen, but God's at work in them. Miracles are things that we don't expect to happen, but God intervening anyway. And in this story, we see God's providence. In your story, we see providence. The, the fact that you're here tonight and you're hearing about who God is and who is, what his character is and that he's providentially in charge of all things is a part of God's providence. The fact that you came here tonight instead of somewhere else is because God wanted that to happen for his will. Okay? Last thing, number three. We see his goodness. God saves his people in a stunning way. So all these, all these little things are going to line up and it's going to be like, man, that's, that's a pretty big dink right there. That's a big coincidence that this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. But we know it's not coincidence. We know it's God's providence that's making it happen, making sure things happen according to his will. But the first thing that happens that's not supposed to happen is that God softens the heart of King Xerxes. I just told you about this guy, ruthless warrior, just in from the battlefield, had a lot of his men killed, is trying to garnish up more troops so he could go back and defeat the Greeks, which he'll be unsuccessful a few years later. This, is, this guy has a law that says if anybody approaches him, they'll be killed unless he called for them to come. 
And even if they did come, when he called for them, he could still kill, have them killed. So when, when Queen Esther comes to him, as she walks in the room, as she approaches him, he has every right to have her killed. And yet, he extends his scepter to her, meaning you're welcome. You're welcome to come here. You're welcome to be here. You don't have to fear. Not only that, but he welcomes her and he goes, ask whatever you want up to half the kingdom. That's a lot. So not only does God change his heart so that he doesn't kill her, but then he welcomes her and he then shows her blessing of whatever you want. Gives her this opportunity to to speak her mind. She then invites him to a party, something that wouldn't really happen because the women would be in a separate place than the men. In this culture, women don't eat with the men. This still happens in a lot of of the, the cultures across the sea that we're not used to. But that wouldn't have been a thing. But yet he comes to the party and he has Haman come as well. So these are all things that Xerxes, in his natural way of doing things, wouldn't have done. But yet God providentially softens his heart so that we get in the position so that she can make the accusation against Haman. The second thing, along with softening the heart of King Xerxes, God works in ways behind the scenes to reverse the roles of Haman and Mordecai. I told you at the beginning in, in chapter 3, Haman is number two in the kingdom. The king trusts him. The king goes to him, speaks to him, is letting him write laws with his own ring, his own signet ring, so he can sign it in the name of King Xerxes. Mordecai is just this guy at the gate. And by the end of this story, Mordecai is going to be number two in the kingdom, and Haman's going to be dead, along with his entire family. This was God reversing the roles and working through everything. Uh, when, when, we wait, when we get to this story, as you continue on in, these, in everything, you can read it all on your own. It's really interesting. Haman wakes up one day, he's like, man, I just hate Mordecai. I hate him so much. And his wife goes, well, we're going to have this big murder party of all the Jews. Why don't you build a gallow or a gallows? Now, this isn't like the Old West with like a noose and, you know, you know, talking about gallows. A gallows back then would have been a pole with a point at the end where they would have impaled people. So basically, he builds up this huge pole in his backyard and he's like, all right, that's for Mordecai. Haman comes in, the king's like, hey, after a bad dream, he learned, he remembered about Mordecai and how he saved him, the king. And so whenever he meets Haman at the thing, he's like, Haman, how would you honor somebody who saved your life? He's like, man, I would put my best clothes on him, like my royal robe. I would put him on a big horse that's, you know, like well known. And then I'd parade him through town. He's like, great, you do that for Mordecai. So Haman, thinking that the king's going to honor him, instead honors Mordecai, his enemy, who he hates, by making Haman throw a parade for him. Haman then goes to this dinner where he is the only guest that's been invited by the king and queen. And he thinks, this is going to be good. And then, of course, Queen Esther throws it out that, Oh, I'm an Israelite, and Haman wants to kill me and my people. And the king gets angry, like he does. He storms off. He's trying to figure out what to do with Haman. And as he leaves, Haman's like, throws himself on the on the bed where Esther is, is begging for her mercy. And when King Xerxes comes back in, he's like, "What are you doing with my wife on my bed?" And he orders him to be killed. They're like, where are we going to kill him? They're like, well, there's a gallow out back. Haman ends up being impaled on his own gallows that he had built for Mordecai. God 
God worked in all of those things, all of those coincidences, all those coinkidinks. He was working in the background to make sure that his people would be saved. That's God's providence. That doesn't mean that Mordecai earned it or was better than any one of you. That doesn't mean that Esther earned it was any better than you. But it means that God was working in the background to save his people. The last, the last thing that we see is, go to verse uh, chapter 9, verse 27. I'm almost done. Hang with me. So basically, they can't, they can't reverse the edict of the king, but what they do is they allow the Jewish people to defend themselves. And they do, and they're able, they, they defend themselves against their enemies. Like I said, Mordecai becomes the number two guy in the kingdom. And they celebrate God's providence, God's working in this to save them with a holiday named Purim. Which Purim is to cast lots. It's like lots that you would cast like for chance, which is interesting because we've been talking about how this isn't just chance. This isn't just a dink that all this happened, that God was working throughout the whole thing. Look at verse, back up to verse 26 because it kind of sets it up. Therefore, they called these days Purim, after the term Pur. Therefore, because of all that was written in this letter and of what they had faced in this matter and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring, so them, their children, and all who joined them. God in his providence, God in his working through this bad situation, not only saved the Israelites, not only saved their children, but also made a way for others, for Gentiles to come to faith. You see that? You see that? God in his providence made a way for others to begin worshiping God out of this bad situation. This was a story that was at the beginning was destined to be a slaughter of the Israelites. And instead, it turned to be a blessing, turned out to be a blessing of his people. I think of it like a game of chess between the devil and God. You know, and at the beginning, there's this edict to kill them all. And devil, I can see the devil going, check. And God and his providence goes, checkmates. He works. So what do we take away from this? I, I, I want to give you three simple things to take away. I'll, I'll keep this short. God is always in control. God is always in control of the good times when things are going good and when things feel like they're off the rails. God is in control. God is working in the background of all things. God is, God is moving and working in all things to bring about his will, even in the bad things. Two, that means that if God is in control, that means that your life has meaning and purpose. If God is in control, that means that your life has meaning and purpose. So no matter how much you've done in the past, whatever that looks like, there's a way for you to be brought in to the family of God, and there's meaning and purpose for you. And there's, there's something cool about when Xerxes extends his scepter to Queen Esther and welcomes her in. Because it, it's, it reminds us not of that king, but it reminds us of the king of kings and the Lord of lords, who because of our disobedience, because of our sin, we separated ourselves from him. We did not have, we did not have any ability to get to him. 
And the only thing that our sin did in our lives was condemn us to death. And instead of rejecting us and leaving us out, our king extended his scepter to us through Jesus Christ. And he made a way so that we could be welcomed in. And instead of going, get out of here, you dirty, rotten person, I'll have you killed. Our God instead says, welcome, what can I do for you? So, maybe tonight for you that means just you, you, you don't understand how this whole Christianity thing works, but know this, our God has extended his scepter to you. He has welcomed you and he's given you a way in. It's through Jesus. And I, I would love to talk to you about that tonight. If that's you, if you have questions about faith and what that means to believe in Jesus, uh, but that's... Uh, we'll, we'll have a conversation later if that's you. Or, or talk to one of our other adult leaders. Hey, raise your hand, adult leaders. See him? See him around the room? If you've got questions, if you don't want to talk to me because I'm the guy with the microphone and that's weird, talk to one of them. They love you guys too. They show up here week after week so that they can be here for you guys and hang out and get to know you, but also so that they can be here to help answer questions that you might have about how to follow Jesus. All right, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the way that you work in the background. That God, even in the midst of the craziness of our lives, even in uh, even in when when things seem to be going wrong, that God, we can trust that you are still in control. So, as as I think about life right now, for you. For, for these teenagers and the tests that they have going on, the, all the events that they have to get to, the trips, the, the family situations, just anything in their life that seems like it's out of control, God, I pray that tonight you would give them peace and comfort because they realize that you are in control. That, God, you are not surprised by the things that we go through. And that, God, you are wanting to work in and through them and in and through their situation to bring about your will. So, God, help them not only to see that you are in control and that that brings them peace and comfort, but, God, that you would help them see what they are to do in that situation so that they can bring about your will. So, God, speak to us and guide us. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.